All right, so we'll be looking at how we should seek the Lord while he may be found. And when we hear that topic, do we believe that there's a time when we cannot find the Lord? Do we believe that there's a time when the Lord cannot be found? Okay, I hear yes in the congregation. There will be a time like that. So it's important now for us to seek him. You know, there's a time of trouble that is coming, right? When should we seek the Lord? Is it before the time of trouble or during or after? Seek him now. That is correct. We only can speak about now. Some of us might not live to see the time of trouble. But we are sure about no, this second. So whilst we have life, let us seek God. Our first scripture is Psalm 32, verse 6. And I would like a reader for us to be participating. Psalm 32, verse 6. And the question is asked, in what time will the godly pray unto God? We're trying to get this answer from the word. Psalm 32, verse 6. Do we have a reader? Amen. So it says, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto me. So in what time will the godly pray unto the Lord? In what time? Based on the scripture we just read. In the time when he can be found, right? Right, in the time when the Lord may be found. Now, we're going to go up one verse now. Psalm 32, verse 5. Amen. So it says that I acknowledge my sin. And there is confession. Right? And the Lord forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now remember, the previous scripture begins by saying, for this. Right? And now Psalm 32 verse 5 was read. So what were the godly praying for? Remember, Psalm, the verse 6 says, for this. For forgiveness of sins, right? Yes. And it is important for us as a people to be afflicting our souls. If we recall um, in the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, when the priest went into the most holy place, what were the persons outside doing? Making confession and re searching, repenting, afflicting their souls. Because nobody outside would know when the priest is finished. Or when he's on his way back out. And remember now that we cannot be found with any sin at that point in time. Now the godly pray for the forgiveness of their sins in the time when Jesus may be found. Now can I have a reader for Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. This should make it much clearer. That's Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. So we are seeking the Lord whilst he may be found, and confessing our sins, and we are so happy that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, where is Christ now so that we can seek him and understand his work in our behalf? Where is Christ now so that we can seek him and understand his work in our behalf? Anybody wishes to answer? Where is Christ now? In the most holy place. And now we're going to turn to the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 8. And we're going to... Have a reader for verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews 8, and another reader, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Amen. Hebrews 9 verse 24. And itself. For Yahshua is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Yahweh for us. Okay, so it says that Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary and he is in the most holy place. And his appearance there is to present our petitions, right? When we confess, when we are afflicting our souls, it is Christ who is interceding on our behalf. Now, since October 22, 1844, Jesus has been in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, doing the work of investigative judgment as was done on the Day of Atonement in the earthly sanctuary. And you can study Daniel 8, 14, and Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Now let's look at the ministry of the high priest in the earthly sanctuary to see what Jesus is doing now in the heavenly. Can someone find for me Leviticus 16, verse 20 and verse 16? That's Leviticus 16. Verse 16 and 20. Yes. And he shall make an atonement for the... Oh, hold on. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that re remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 20, you said? Verse 20. And when he had made an, an end of the reconciling, so reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the, li the live goat. He shall bring the live goat. Mm -hmm. No... The question is, what did the high priest cleanse on the day of atonement, and why did he have to cleanse it? And that's from the scriptures that you just read. Anybody wish to respond? What did the high priest cleanse on the day of atonement? Cleanse the sanctuary. And why did he have to clean this sanctuary? Because of the sins. 
אוקיי. אוקיי, so the sanctuary needed cleansing because of Israel's sins, right? Their transgressions. Because remember, it says of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So that's why the, the day of atonement was important. What were the people to do? What were the people to be doing while the high priest was cleansing the sanctuary? Afflicting their souls. Um, you can find it in Leviticus 23, verse 27. What does the Bible say? Month. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy co convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Amen. So remember the topic, seek the Lord while he may be found. And we are all in agreement that Christ is in the most holy place right now, interceding on our behalf. And there is coming a time when there will be no more intercessor. And remember now, our probation closes at what point? At the end of his work, in this most holy. No. No, 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 no. Death. At death, right? At death. Yes, <laughs> let it be clear. Yes. So if I die I was... now, my probation closes. Um, we know overall, when he stands, it is finished for everyone. But for us now, if we should pass now, our probation close. Go ahead, sis, I see your hand. If it can be closed before death, yes, based on when the names have been called. So continue, you have to follow. Just a moment, wait for the mic, sis. I'm wondering, in the case of if I get mentally ill tomorrow, or am I in a state of the mental illness? What, oh. what do we think happened there? Or if I get a stroke where maybe my cognitive thoughts are not within the norm, what yeah. happens? Yeah, there? I understand what you're saying. Um, I cannot be like the Holy Spirit, and there are ways in which the Holy Spirit can speak to persons even if they can't speak to us, and they can respond accordingly. So I don't have an answer to say whether or not it's a sure thing that their probation closes or not, because, you know, some persons, we, we, we pass as being mad or mentally off, they have some things still in check somehow. So you want to help me to answer that, Ella? Um, as it relates to mental illness and so forth, um, your probation <coughs> closes if you have caused the Holy Spirit to walk away from you. So if he has been prompting you and prompting you and you have rejected him repeatedly and he walks away from you, then your probation will close. If you get a, a mental illness, it doesn't say that your mental illness will be forever. You, you can get healing and come back. And in your mental illness, you will not be responsible for, for what, what is in your mind because you're not able to control your mind. But the question you need to ask yourself, what state of mind was I in before um, this mental illness or, or let's say this stroke? What, what, what state was I in? Was I um, in a connection with the Lord? 
was I was I in a situation where I was being prompted by the Holy Spirit and and I kept rejecting. So those are questions that that we have to ponder on. That is why um, we are encouraged to live each day as if it is our last. Amen. Amen. I'm in full agreement. Um, so as we said, we are not the final judge in terms of what happens with, with any individual. Because sometimes this is some persons, they say they're in coma, and the spirits can work with them still. So I don't have that foresight to say whether or not that person has been lost in terms of probation, being closed, or whatever the case is. Only the Almighty knows, right? But Yes, so uh, my sister was saying that we have persons who are saying that probation is actually closed on. You know, sometimes though, sometimes we might be out there, you know, witnessing to some persons that probation closed on, you know. Yes, and you might be wondering why this person just... But it's not for us to say anything in terms of judgment or assumptions we do not know if the spirit reveals it to us then fine but there will be persons among us that probation has already been closed on but it's not for us to stop witnessing and sharing the love of god even if probation closed on that person you sharing the love of jesus with that person you can read somebody else that probation has not yet been closed and it's just for us to go and to do the work of god amen now, since the Israelites could not see the high priest work in the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, they were to have faith that he was cleansing the sanctuary from their sins. Additionally, they did not know exactly when he had completed his work and was on his way out of the sanctuary. Therefore, they continued to afflict their souls until they saw him. Remember this point as it will be addressed a little later. So just as we're saying now that we don't want to be judging persons, Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, no. None of us knows when anybody's name is called and, you know, we are not there seeing the books and seeing the progress, right? So we cannot get comfortable or complacent and say, oh, my name, no, no, my name, the fire down the list. You know, sometimes some persons say, you might go somewhere and they're calling names. And for me, most time I try to pick up a trend. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's alphabetical. Is it alphabetical by surname or by first name? But not so with God. We don't have that. <laughs> we cannot make those assumptions to say whether or not how the books are being, you know? Go, um, gone through. That's why we have to be afflicting our souls daily. Secondly, no break. Just like how the enemy is working to destroy and to kill us full time. We must be afflicting our souls full time. Even, you know, some persons might, you know, when you think about the scribes and the Pharisees and, um, you know, how Jesus would have called them some names, you know, Describe them in some particular ways. And it is important, you know, when the Bible says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, we ain't going nowhere. It is important. Why? Because sometimes in the spiritual journey, brethren, we might feel like, you know, the spiritual is strong, you know. Um, some persons might believe that they are dear. And based on, based on, Self-righteousness, no, you might treat persons like, oh, you are dear and they are here. And it's not for, it's, it's constantly within Christ's sight. We are in need of the blood of Jesus. So we have to continue to afflict our souls until when it is finished or we should pass. Now, when Jesus finishes his work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. What does this signify? 
Um, do you want the scripture first or you want to try and respond? When Christ finishes his work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, what does this signify? What does this mean? Ending of intercession. So Daniel 12 verse 1. Can somebody find that for me please? And Luke 13, 25 to 27. So Daniel 1, Daniel 12 verse 1. That's a well-known text. Somebody is standing. Yes. You want to read? You reading? Question? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. If heaven is a holy place, how comes? I want some more time to think about the question. Okay. Do we have a reader for Daniel 12, verse 1? Yeah. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to, to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Amen. You remember the first question as we started the study? We spoke about the time of trouble and we asked the question, when should we be afflicted in our souls? Before, during, or after? And we see the scripture is telling us here. When Michael stands up, what comes after? There shall be a time of trouble. You, you ready to ask the question now, Dave? Go ahead. If heaven is a holy place, how comes? All right. Look, look, the, the Holy Spirit is telling us something, Dave. Look. 13, verse 25 to 27. We have a reader for that one. Luke chapter 13, 25 to 27. Use the mic, please, for those who are online. Mike? 13.25 to 27, you said? That's correct. And it says, When once the master of the house is risen up and had shut to the door, and he began to stand without, without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and ye shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall he begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets, seven, seven twenty-seven. But he shall say, "I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity." Amen. So the question again: What does the cleansing, when the finish, when Jesus finishes work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, what does this signify? And we can see here that is the end of probation, because he says, when they come knocking. I said, depart. No, don't come in, right? It's, it's like the art door being shut. There is no way again for the persons to get an opportunity to enter. Go ahead, Brother Dave. Oh, you weren't here last week? Yes, it, it needs cleansing, um, Brother Dave. Similar to the earthly sanctuary. The records, the records, the records of our sins is in this sanctuary. All right, so I'm going to read a quotation from the Great Controversy, page 614. It says, When he leaves the sanctuary, 
Darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. Can you imagine that time? When, with all the wickedness that we're seeing now in the land, there is still restraint. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The world, the whole world, will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. Now, once Jesus leaves the heavenly sanctuary, what will happen to unrepentant sinners? And somebody can find for me Leviticus 23, verse 29. So let us use the word to respond. Once Jesus leaves the heavenly sanctuary, what will happen to the unrepentant sinners? Leviticus 23, verse 29. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. He shall be cut off. And what does that mean? It's in the earthly sanctuary, no, no. Okay. So the heavenly sanctuary would mean that you have been lost, right? We, the unrepentant sinners would be cut off. Now, there's a scripture um, that speaks to the swelling of the Jordan. And we saw where in Psalm 36 it talks about the floods of great waters. No. There's a quotation that I'll be reading. But I have a note. It says, as you read the following quotation, bear in mind that at this time the Sunday law has passed. God's faithful saints have been tested and sealed. And then they go forth to give the final warning to the world for others to join God's ranks. Once the third angel's message finishes sounding, probation closes on the world, and all cases are eternally decided. You hear that last part? Once the third angel's message finishes sounding, probation closes on the world, and all cases are eternally decided decided. I'm going Amen. to read this quote. Amen. It says, and, and when I look at that passage that you read, it, says, it shows us, remember that when Yosha was saying that I am the divine and you are the branches, mm -hmm. yeah. and here when you read, read that passage earlier on, it said and if, if, if you've been cut off from the, the divine, yeah, that branch when it chopped off, it just withered and died. Yeah. So you can literally see that those persons are those who are lost. Yes. Amen. And, and it is the same for us now, in the sense that if we do not abide in Christ, we can be cut off. Um, we don't know about the probation aspect of it, but just by living a, a, a Christ-like life, if we don't abide in Christ, then we are getting weaker and weaker, which eventually leads to being cut off. Now, when the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have accomplished their work. They have received the latter rain. 
the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then Jesus seizes his intercession in the sanctuary above. So one of the things that precedes the close of the intercession is the sealing, right? So God's people must be sealed before he steps out, before he stands up. He lifts his hands with a loud voice, says, it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. He that is just, well, I like to say the just first, right? So it says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And that can be found in Revelation 22, verse 11. Now, every case has been decided for life or death, whether eternal life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made up, the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation, and Jesus is to reign King of kings and Lord of lords. And that can be found in the great controversy, page 613, paragraph 2. Deva, see your hand. Yes, but you realize that there's no sin in anybody when probation closes for you to be righteous. Right, Dave? For, for us to enter heaven, there will be no sin. And that is, the, that is the conclusion of the whole matter. So if we want to make it into the kingdom of God, by God's grace and his mercies, no spot, no blemish, no sin can be found in us. Yeah. Now, since the righteous do not know the exact moment when Jesus will finish his ministry in the most holy place and close probation, what will be their experience leading up to the time of trouble and during it? And I'm going to read something from Early Writings, page 269. It says, I saw some with strong and agonizing cries, pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was ex expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God approbation, and again the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. And if you remember Jesus in the final stages, you know, he was sweating, and what, turned, what happened to his sweat? It became drops of blood. And so we as a people have to be agonizing, you know, it's a struggle, you know between the spiritual man and the flesh. But the spirit must always take control. And so daily we are struggling, daily we are struggling. And we know not when the, when the work has been complete or will be complete. So we have to be agonizing every single day. As we transition, while the righteous seek God when he is still extending mercy and offering forgiveness of sins, 
The wicked will seek God when he can no longer be found. So when the great time of trouble comes, a lot of wicked people will be crying out to the Lord and trying to seek him at that point in time. But it is too late. Too late, the songwriter says, would be their cry. Too late. But we do not want to fall in that class of people. We want to be found righteous. Now, what did Jesus say to the Pharisees? In John chapter 8, verse 19, 21, and 24. That's John chapter 8, verses 19, 21, and 24. Do we have a reader? John chapter 8, 19, 21, and 24. Then said they unto him, where, then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, He neither know me nor my father. If he had known me, he should have known my father also. 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and he shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, he cannot come. 24. Then 24. I said therefore unto you, that he shall die in your sins. For if he believe not that I am he, he shall die in your sins. So the wicked will die in their sins because they would have not accepted Christ. They would have not been pleading to God and repenting whilst he could have been found. Now Jesus told the Pharisees that because of their unbelief, and unwillingness to accept him as their savior, they would seek him when it was too late and die in their sins. This is the end result for all those who reject Christ as their savior from sin. Let us now look at the account of Noah to see that many of the antediluvians sought after God when it was too late. And we are going to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 5. And if you feel impressed to share a point, please just raise your hands. That's Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 5. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Five, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. All right, Matthew 24, verse 38 and 39. Matthew chapter 24, verses 38 and 39. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. 39. 39. And know not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. So what kept the antediluvians from accepting the message of salvation to get aboard the ark. What do you think kept them kept them out from accepting the message of salvation? What are some of the things you believe that? Is marrying a bad thing? No, marrying is not a bad thing, right? So what do you think kept them out? Unbelief. And um, worldly pleasures also. And that is one of the greatest challenges. You know, sometimes persons are so enticed with what the world has to offer them. Even though you're witnessing to persons and they might find some excuses. Um, remember the parable? When they, when they bid them to come to the, the marriage. Oh, I just got married and I need to <laughs> go on honeymoon. Um, I just bought a piece of land and, you know, business is going well. So 
These things are some of the things that will keep a lot of persons from accepting the message of salvation because I guess maybe they believe there's more time, but the enemy uses these snares, the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. And those three things are what will keep us if we do not accept the message to be doomed. Now, what did the wicked antediluvians do once the ark door was shut and the rain began to fall? What do you think they did when, when the door was shut and the rain started falling? Huh? Cry for mercy. Bang the door. <laughs> oh, my. And, and, you know, it is so sad for us. And if we live, if some of us live through the time of trouble and stuff, then maybe you would have a similar situation. But the reading says that the violence of the storm increased and there were mingled with the warring of the elements, the wailings of the people who had despised the authority of God. No, use your imagination, brethren. We're in here and we're just visualize this picture. Trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. And even Satan himself, who was compelled to be amid the warring elements, feared for his own existence. He had delighted to control so powerful a race and wished them to live to practice their abominations and increase their rebellion against the God of heaven. He now uttered imprecations against God, charging him with injustice and cruelty. Now Satan called God wicked enough. You know? Can look how you flood out the people them now, you kill them off. Many of the people like Satan blasphemed God. And if they could have carried out their rebellion, would have torn him from the throne of justice. Others were frantic with fear, stretching their hands toward the ark and pleading for admittance. But this was impossible. God had closed the door, the only entrance, and shut Noah in and the ungodly out. He alone could open the door. Their fear and repentance came too late. Conscience was at last awake to know that there was a God who ruled in the heavens. They called upon him earnestly, but his ear was not open to their cry. Some in their desperation sought to break into the ark. You can imagine you now like burglars. They're trying to break their way into the ark. But that firm made structure resisted all their efforts. Some clung to the ark. Now people are grabbing, you know, hold on to the ark. Until they were borne away with furious surging of the waters. Of their hold was broken off by rocks and trees that were swept here and there by the angry billows. Now the ark severely rocked and tossed. With the noise of the tempest was mingled the roaring of terrified beasts. Remember no, you, were, you had animals out there. Yet amid all the warring of the elements, the ark rode safely. Angels that excel in strength guided and preserved it from harm. Every moment during that frightful storm of 40 days and 40 nights, the preservation of the ark was a miracle of the almighty power. Bridget, this scene is water. And he says, no more water. I don't want to even imagine. Now, how many days after Noah and his family entered the ark did God send the rain? Seven days, and that can be found in Genesis 7, verse 10. 
Now what were Noah and his family doing in that time as the Israelites did on the day of atonement? Hebrews 11 verse 7. No, no, they never saw rain before that day. And that's what it takes to enter the kingdom. If without faith you can please God, I'm Dave. And there's a scripture that says, because they don't have faith. Without faith is a sin. You know, don't have faith is a sin, you know? Your hand still up, Dave? In this scripture, 11 verse 7, Hebrews 11. By faith Noah, being warned of Yahweh of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his people, by, by, the which, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So what, no, what, what happened to Noah there? You see that there? He became here of the righteousness, which is by faith. So um, you mentioned before, if the persons never saw rain, why would they go on the ark? No, no one ever saw rain either, Dave. And he, he was the one who constructed it. And you know, same, he, you know, he wasn't thinking in his right mind. After constructing the ark, and he was preaching for how long? That, that is more than faith, right? So we need to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Go again. If everybody was holy, at, at the present moment, they were saved during that situation, right? However they lived after is, is just like... Um, well, you just say Adam and Eve sinned, but they repented at one point, right? You have others who sinned and them just never repent. You have persons, um, let me explain it another way now. You see, this present moment, Dave, this present moment in time. You see, if I have afflicted my soul and confessed all my sins, and the good Lord has repented me, I am perfect in Christ, because we are first justified by him, and sanctification is the work of a lifetime, right? So I would say, secondly, and a milliseconds, as small a time you can put it, Dave, we have to be sanctified. So you can be righteous, no, and you fall down. You stumble when you commit that sin. But the Bible says he is just to forgive us if we confess our sins. Right? And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you go back to the day of atonement, Dave, remember the day of atonement now at the sanctuary. The persons were on the outside afflicting their souls. And the scripture says, those who did not they were cut off when the priests exited the most holy place. And so it's the same thing with us today, daily. Remember now, Christ is interceding on our behalf in the sanctuary. So once saved is not always saved. So if I confess and repent right now, and when I leave church, I go and sin. The sins are there. And the only way they can be blotted out is through the Messiah. We confessing and repenting, right? That answers your question? Okay, then. Sis, you have your hand up. Mike. It's not one time save, save. As long as we are Christian, when we accepted Christ first and acknowledge our sins and ask for forgiveness, he forgives us. And of course, when we genuinely 
baptized, we bury the whole man and we rise with the new man. Even though sometimes people said some go down, devil, dry devil come up with devil. But the Christian life is a process. As long as you live and you have life, you have to be praying. You have to fast and pray. You don't wait till the church tell you to fast and pray. You daily pray. Have a prayerful mind, asking God to cleanse you. And within that process, you'll make mistakes, but you don't stay in that mistake and continue to do it. When you realize, you keep asking God to forgive you and ask him to help you not to continue. So you grow. That's what you call grow. If you're just a Christian and you're not growing away from the things that you used to when you're in the world, then something is wrong. So as long as you continue the process, humbling yourself, praying as the sister said, asking forgiveness, acknowledge when you're wrong, if your probation should close, you're going to die in Christ with that mindset. Sis, when Noah did uh, get set up by the flood, and the rest of seen of them were in other world, John did. How come sins exist back in in the in other nation? Because Noah sons. The, you see, those people was not obedient. Obedience and faith, as the sister says, is the key. Noah and his family were obedient, okay? So they were saved. So they were counted righteous at that time because they were obedient to God and listened to the warning. The other nation didn't. But after God saved them through, with the, in the ark, their sons came and did bad. Those people, you know, sinning again. So until now, it is going on, even to our generation. But Christ is saying that, David said, I acknowledge my sin and my sin is ever before me. So you have to think about you now as an individual if you want to be saved what kind of lifestyle you're going to choose to live. But you have to know that you're going to have to daily pray and ask God to intervene in your life so he can transform. His transforming power can transform your life daily into his likeness. So as long as you live or we live, we have to continue on that part, praying and asking him, and as the sister said, you pray, you ask for forgiveness. If you fall down, get up. Don't stay down. And by you doing that, you never know if your probation closed, you will have that mindset in Jesus to be saved because you humble yourself and you're obedient. You acknowledge your sin and you give it to the Lord and you ask the Lord to help you to grow and you're growing. So All right, if, Dave, let me respond to you. Right? You ask the question, if, why... Sin existed after the flood. Right? That's the question. Um, did the flood take away Satan? No. no. Okay. So remember that. The flood did not wash away Satan. He did not die at that time. So the great controversy continues. And we are all in this great conflict. And we make choices every second. So yes, they were saved in the ark. When they came to the dry land, Satan was still around, right? And they were faced with temptations and all these things and made conscious choices. That's okay for you? All right, you can go ahead. Well, um, to answer his question, I think the question he's driving at, he might be in, he even have the answer. Those who were saving the heart, not all were righteous. They were, the righteous was, righteousness was imputed to them. Yeah. They were saved upon the merit of Noah, just like how today 
Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us. So it is based upon Christ's righteousness why we are saved. Similarly, they entered into the ark they, because they made a choice to obey and follow Abraham, but not Abraham, Noah. But Noah was the man who stood firm. Yeah, but remember, no, you know, the scripture just said, what were Noah and his family doing? Similar to what the Israelites did in the day of I'm, an, I'm, I'm responding to his question because when we read the scripture, the scripture did not tell us that Noah's children were, were, were faithful. They did not, it's not they who moved by faith. It was Noah who moved by faith. And based upon Noah's faith. But they had to have faith to move in and terms I, of and I'm not, agreeing with I, I'm not parents. disagreeing with you. I'm yes. not disagreeing with you, but I'm saying that we have to have faith to be saved. Right. But if, if we try to be righteous by ourselves, without Christ's righteousness, mm -hmm. it is futile. Right. Without right. Noah's faith, they would not enter into the heart because they did not have enough faith, if, for want of a better word, to mind. say, I'm going to set out and believe that there are going to be rain and act upon that. Noah who, was the one who believed that. Right. And the scriptures made mention, when we read Hebrews, it says by faith, Noah. It never says by Faith, Noah's, Noah's family. family. Because the family, and that is what, and remember, the, the concept was just like what Joshua could have said, as for me and my house. No, today is, no, we don't, it is no longer the family. So the father, the mother could be righteous. That does not pass down to the children. They have to make a decision for themselves. And that is why when Christ comes again, it will be difficult for us to go back because it's not that somebody's righteousness will get us into heaven. No. It will be our choice to overcome. So we would have seen and make a decision that we would turn from sin. Amen. And when we make that decision, then it is more difficult for us to go back. Amen. And if you remember a lot, and if you remember a lot, the angel had to pull them out of Saddam and Gomorrah. So, <laughs> you, think, you talk about the family and Noah's faith. Yes, and even And Israel. they moved on their own. But in yes. that case, the angel himself had to hold them and pull them out of Saddam. And what did Lot's wife do? Look back. Yes, so I was going to point that out because um, to make, for me, clear. The, the, the Bible said Noah and his family. Now, Noah's family could have chosen not to go with him. Could say, man, you're crazy. We have never seen rain. How comes you telling us about rain? But Noah, as, as the, the preacher said today, trained up his children in the way of the Lord. So they trusted their father that their father really was hearing from God. And they made that decision to stand with their father in the decision that their father made. So they were, were, were counted righteous with, um, with Noah. So, so that, but after everybody go on their own, as the sister said, the devil um, was around. So they were tempted. I was going to go to Lot, where when the angel go for Lot, they didn't go for Lot alone. They go for his family too. But there were family, there were children who did not choose to go with the angel and Lot, his wife, go because it's like maybe she feels she was forced to go, but she, she, didn't, she didn't willingly go. So therefore, she get messed up along the line. So it's all the, to how I see it. It wasn't just that they were saved just by Noah's merit, which is good. That's a good example. They were saved because of the choice that they make with their father. To be saved. Otherwise, I don't think they would have been saved. But it's a good point that the brother bring out. Amen. Amen. Yes, too. And remember that back then, Israel was to be saved as a nation, not as individuals. So based on what he was saying, they followed Noah into the ark so that they were saved as a group. Okay. And but at the end of it all, we all have a choice to make. And we cannot depend on mother, father, husband, wife, nor child, cousin, whatever the relationship is, that their righteousness will cover us. Remember the ten foolish virgins. If that was the case, they could have shared the oil. 
There won't be any oil and sharing out. You're going to go and buy your own. So we have to have that personal connection for ourselves. Make the personal choice to be saved. My sister, I see your hand around there. And, and just to add to what was said, you see even so the church depict here as the leader. Whenever the leader is sturdy and connected to Yahweh, the lead right and the flock will follow because you notice it's by the leading of Moses why you see this, 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 his sons follow him and, and, and yield to, to, to what he said. Because remember the message about family life and all these things. You see the, the teaching right there pertaining to the, 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 the role that the father has set up in the house. Yeah? And the principle so that when decisions come, they can make the right decision because they were taught and trained in the fear and the ammunition of father. Amen. All right. So for seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. During this period, their faith was tested. Now, to go back to what they were saying, from the end of the ark and the door closed, the rain start falling, you know? You know, think the children are wondering, oh, that is the rain of come. Or maybe know himself as a, where's the rain? No, it was a time of triumph to the world without. The apparent delay confirmed them in the belief that Noah's message was a delusion and that the flood would never come. These are the people on the outside, you know. I'm not seeing no rain drop. That man is a madman. And him lock up inside here with the animals. I can imagine. No, notwithstanding, the solemn scenes which they had witnessed, the bees and the birds entering the ark and the angel of God closing the door. Now, after the people see so much animals, look so orderly and nice. I mean, we know about these animals now. They kill each other. And they were so orderly and they went onto this ark and the door was shut. They still continued their sport and their revelry, even making a jest of these signal manifestations of God's power. The people them outside a party, I said, watch them in an ark. Can we play with favorite song? They gathered in crowds about the ark, deriding its inmates with a daring violence which they had never ventured upon before. And that can be found in Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 98, paragraph 3. Note, the judgment of the flood upon the antediluvian world would also represent the plagues that will fall upon unrepentant sinners in these last days once probation has closed and they are found outside of God's ark of mercy and salvation. And we can read now Revelation 15.1, just to clarify this statement. Revelation 15.1 and Revelation 16.1 and 2. So the first text is Revelation 15, and the, verse and, 1. And, and, I, this, go ahead. And, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of Yahweh. 16, 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of Yahweh upon the earth. And the first went, and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So two sets of people there, right? Those who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And you can imagine those vials that were released. But there is hope in this scripture. What took place before these vials were thrown out? God's people were sealed. Just like Noah and his family were in the ark before the flood. God's people will be sealed before we have these plagues. Now the final question says, 
Who else tried to repent after he saw that probation has closed for him? And I'm going to leave you to meditate upon this. Read Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. We can read the text. Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Yahshua to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou that, see thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. You hear what Judas did? He went and hanged himself. He? But it's not like he never repented. But it was too late. And I am praying for all of us that by God's grace, we won't fall into a similar circumstance like the examples shown, even Judas himself, where upon, you know, the close of probation, we would have sought to seek the Lord when he no longer can be found. You have your hand up, sis? Yeah, I was just looking at when um, Judas repented. And I remember Peter also when Yasha told him that he will deny him. And here I look at these two persons who repented, but one didn't sincerely. This one go and hang himself because genuine repentance work its sorrow. And based on what he would understand that he wouldn't drive himself to hang himself. Because remember that Yasha was still alive and he could go to him. The probation was there still mm. based on the prophecy of it, the, the, the 70 weeks which was pointed onto them. And he was present. So he chose not to because of what he, he, he see what he's done. But Peter genuinely re repent and sorrow and, and, and turn and, and choose to do that, which is right. But he go and hang himself. Can a man justify himself by hang himself? To yes, say? but it shows you how far gone he was. Yeah, was Peter wasn't so far gone. You know, when we play with sin, I think the speaker mentioned it even this morning. When we meddle with this thing called sin, we can reach to a point of no return. And I believe that's where Judas brought himself to. Not that he wouldn't have an opportunity or whatever, but he went so far gone into sin that there wasn't any point of return. Your hand. Your hand. You know, for, um, for Judas, Judas' probation closed from the very moment he got up from the table. Yes, from that very moment, Jesus said to him, go and do what thou doest quickly. From that very moment, if Judas has stayed behind, then there will be hope for him. But him hanging himself, he had, after he left the table, he had no other luck in that part with Jesus. His probation closed then. Um, just to continue, because that's the point I was going to, but just to continue on where she left off, if you notice before he left the table, Jesus had given him the opportunity to repent. Now, the difference between Judas and Peter, one is a planned sin. So G Judas sit down and he planned it. He had enough time to think on it. Now, the, Peter, even though he was forewarned, it was still impulsive. So in the moment, fearing the, the, because of the, 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 fearing the consequence, he said something that really you know, comes out of fear. And when he recognized what was done, he was willing enough to, to say, hey, I'm sorry. But Judas and the Hanan saw the consequence, but because his eyes were fixed and connected to, 
or let me not say fix it, his love was transferred. So he loved the world, our money, more than we love Jesus. So he, but when he recognized, it's like you, you never recognize that once you do this, then the bank is shut down. Amen. So now you recognize the bank is closed. You're sorry because you're not going to get more. Amen. So, so can, until you get the mic, I just want to comment. Um, when you look at the two scenarios, though, both were given a warning. Jesus said at the Passover, right? Somebody will, one of you, he never said, like he said to Peter, that you're going to deny me. But he made the statement that somebody will, will, um, Yes, so that was the confirmation. But they had the opportunity, the warning. You see, God never rewards us or allows things to happen without first warning his people. So he warned the disciples of one who is to go again, betray him. And he told Peter that he would deny. But what they did after the warning would determine whether or not their probation closed. Go ahead, Sissy, add hand up. Uh, I, just a little bit more further, but everything he said is good. I, based on God's word, I think it's Proverbs 30, where it said, remove pride far away from me. It's like Peter swallowed his pride and asked for forgiveness. Judas was to me, based on the whole thing with him, even when Jesus spoke to him and he had the chance. Both of them had chance. Judas have chance. Peter had chance. Both of them were forewarned because Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me. And, and Jesus let Judas know that, hey, I know you're going to do what you're going to do. But after Peter did that, you see, to, to me to, to know Christ and to turn your back on him is very, very dangerous. It could endanger your salvation. Judas had the chance to repent, but he was too proud to humble himself and seek forgiveness. Peter, in the other hand, knowing Christ, when he sees Christ's eyes look on him, he remembered what Jesus said to him. And in humility, he went and, and cried and seek for forgiveness, and he got forgiveness. And plenty of us today, we have to be very careful in the message because I've seen people accept this message. And I was a raised Adventist, but I embrace this message. And I've seen people who were born in it, are in it a long time, longer than me, no more stuff than me. And they left the message and the things that they are saying and leading other people astray. It's very dangerous. I'm quickly going to say this quickly. I've known people who were born in it and come in and stay in God church and drag people out and go and form something by themselves. And I wouldn't tell you what happened to them. The, the, the God, they really get a beaten. Some died. Some look like whole men. And this is not, I'm not asking. I know this is true. It's very, very dangerous to come in contact with God and reject him. It was, to me, it was pride why but, Judas committed but, suicide. Because you see what you said a while Amen. ago? I can add to that as a testimony since week. Okay. Just, just, just a shot with what she said a while quickly, ago about persons quick, who, quickly, please. who was in the faith and turned them back and cost church and cost people and cost church members and all of these things. And this week I witnessed that same person body was found. Dog, eat him. Eat him. Yeah? And I know the last time I remember talking to that person, that person was cussing all children wherever and classing and wherever. And the way the person speak over in life, because I always tell him, stop say them something there, brother. Stop say it. And he say, who oh, if me dead? No, nobody see me. Something yummy. And the same thing happened to him. He was eaten. He was eaten that they don't have anything to find. And his skull and his ear, that and, and, and few little fragments of his bone. Since week. Of mercy. Yeah? So, thank you for that. Um, 
testimony and the sharing. And we thank God for his words. And we are going to be temperate in all things. Moving on to the next segment. Dave, we'll have to take your hand another time. We, we can go ahead. I, I got permission, Dave. You can go ahead with your question. You need a mic, please. Yeah. If Judas never did the cheer Christ, who would have? Praise God. The fulfillment of prophecy, right? Only the Godhead can answer that question. Thank you very much, Dave. And we're about to close. We are going to pray to close. And um, by God's grace, we will apply all that we would have learned to our lives so that our lives can be sanctified as we are justified by Christ our Savior. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. And more and more, Lord, I see how wonderful it is to delve in your word, to study, to Share with each other, Lord, so that we can all learn. We thank you, Lord, for the working of the Holy Spirit in this place. And we pray, Lord, that we will not just be hearers of the word, but that we will be doers. So that, Lord, when probation closes, it will be well with our souls. Help us, Lord, to remain faithful and to make the right choices for righteousness abide with us i pray holy spirit baptize us afresh in Jesus' name i pray amen okay person for ay you can come Okay, it's me again, and I will have company soon. I hope you're not tired of us being here, but we're going to be singing a few songs. Yeah. It's song service for AY, and we have to be lively, not like Sabbath school. So we want to stand first, so we stretch our legs, you know? Lunch was nice, and the word was even better. Yum. Let's sing first. What do you think about Jesus? He's alright. What do you think about Jesus? He's alright. What do you think about Jesus? He's alright. He's Jesus, Jesus, he's all right. Jesus, 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 he's all right. Jesus, 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 he's all right. He's all right, all right, all right. What a mighty God we
long as I'm on this control, it is all right. Goodbye, world. I'll stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I'll stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way. stretching our hands yeah. and our legs. Mm -hmm. We need them on them feet. Father Abraham, yeah. so we're going to stand at this moment. Too comfortable, man. We have to work out the lunch. And Father Abraham, yeah. and I am one of them, and so are you, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, Lord right? And Father Abraham, how many songs as many songs are Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. Praise the Lord. So let's just praise the Lord. Right and left and Father Abraham, of many songs, of many songs are Father Abraham, and I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right hand, left hand, right foot. Father Abraham, of many songs, of many songs, our Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. is very fit. I tell you. Happy for, happy for that. Yeah. We're going to be singing Won't It Be a Time. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to that day. Yeah. Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? And won't it be a time when we get over Time. We're gonna sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. We're gonna sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. We're gonna sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. Whoa, won't it be a time? Amen.
Love at all. There is beauty all around when there's love at all. There is joy in every sound when there's love at all. Peace and plenty here abide, smiling fair on every side. Time that softly, sweetly glide when there's love at all. Love at all. Love at all. Time that softly, sweetly glide when there's love at all. Kindly heaven smiles above when there's love. Let us remain standing for the AOI ideals, which is the, the aim, motto, pledge, and law. All those who can stand, please stand, as long as you are not sick. And we stand at attention for the pledge the aim is let's go the aim the advent message to all the world in my generation the motto for the love of the love of Christ compels me and we use the pathfinder law which is the ay pledge Loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the youth ministry of the church, doing what I can to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. The song. Adventist youth are away from every land and sea 
Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for life. We are indeed grateful for your goodness that keeps running after us because we are undeserving of any good thing from you. But the, because there is no mountain that you won't tear down to get to us, you have sought to run after us and to redeem us unto yourself. We pray your blessing upon this evening's proceedings. And we pray that we will learn what we need to learn in order to save us in your kingdom. Thank you for hearing and answering us. Through Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Well, we are coming to the close of the Sabbath very soon. Um, what time does the sun set today? 6 o'clock or 6.30? 6 o'clock? All right, so we have a short program. Um, I need three groups. And you know, this evening I feel like using our fathers. So I'm going to choose three males to lead our groups. All right? So I'm just going to give out the papers quickly. I have the, the names of the persons in my head. All right? So I'm just going to call them. Brother Kodna, group three. So you have group three. You're going to come right here. We have some per You have Jessica and some other persons working with you. Let me come down closer. So we have three groups, Brother Kadna, Elder Lee, and Brother, who did I give that one to? <laughs> All right, so find your group and work with them. Elder Lee, you can go over that side. See, I have Sister Brown and some others working with. Five minutes, and then you just answer the questions quickly. Okay? They're very easy. Somebody just come and tell us what went on in the discussion. All right? Answer the questions. <laughs> 